Um, you, of course, were born in this region, uh, in Jarrow. And then um, you went to university. Oh, I wanted to be near my mother, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then you, went, you did drama, is that right, uh, in Manchester? Um, went to do a degree in drama, uh, assuming that when my time was up, I'd become a teacher because I couldn't see any path for myself into um, uh, this world, you know, um, of writing or producing. TV in influenced me, actually, mm. in, in wanting to become a writer, although I didn't know I was being influenced. But the sheer f the fact, the salient fact, is that I watched a hundred TV plays before I ever went to the theatre. Um, and so, funnily enough, when I became a theatre writer, I was constantly being told that my style was episodic, i.e. short scenes moving quickly. <laughs> and that was because that's what I thought writing was, and that's what I thought drama was, because it was all about films and TV, but particularly TV. Well, I have uh, a 26-year-old daughter who's trying to make her way in this business now, just as I was 30 years ago. And uh, I look at her experiences and the struggle to get going in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an industry which has changed almost beyond recognition from when I started. You know, and, I'm, and I worry about her and many like her that they're not getting a fair crack at the whip. It's one of those funny things, you know, I got into writing the way Pontius Pilate got in the creed, you know, wrong man, wrong place, right time. <laughs> and um, I was offered a job by Contact Theatre, um, which had just started up a young people's theatre company in Manchester in a building attached to the drama department where I'd studied, so they sort of knew me. Uh, I was offered a job as the ASM, so I wrote a play called Heartbreak Hotel about a band uh, a rock and roll band, and um, oddly enough, there was a queue around the block on the first night because there was a band in it. And, uh, and I thought, ooh, I'm a, I'm a playwright. And um, it sort of went from there, really. Um, I couldn't get a job as a director to save my life, but I kept being offered little bits and pieces as a writer. There's, um, outside of the soaps, so few opportunities for people to get into this business as writers, as producers, not as actors, I don't think, but writers and producers. I don't know where you start. The truth is, 30 years ago, somebody gave me my television debut doing five times 90 minutes. I didn't know I was on a quest to find a voice, it, but when I wrote that first play, Savage Amusement, which I now regard as my first play, although it was my seventh play, uh, this is 1978 uh, by now, yeah, 77, 78, um, I found a voice that I didn't know I had. Mm. Um, and that, in his own way, brings, brings difficulties. I mean, you've got to do it, but it brings its own difficulties because the next time somebody asked me to... I mean, it, our subject was quite a success in London. Um, and then, of course, you have to do a follow-up, and I was paralysed. I mean, by the sound of my own voice and by the sound of the critics pointing out what my voice was and my style. I had a style, apparently, I had a voice. I had no idea I had these things. Um, and suddenly you become totally self-conscious about the process of writing, and that, of course, killed it stone dead. And I found it hard, actually, for about a year to write something else. And second play, Itis, I, I think will probably be something that's uh, known to a few people in the room. And um, I thought I'd, write, I'd like to write a history play, and I'd like to write a... a, a, a contemporary chronicle play, really, a chronicle play about England, and I, I hit upon our friends in the North through various conversations and um, came up here to begin researching it in 1980, went through the phone book and found T. Dan Smith, mm -hmm. uh, rang him up and said, uh, you don't know me, but I'm, uh, I'm the resident playwright at the Royal Shakespeare Company. <laughs> And uh, I'd like to write a play about corruption in British public life. And, uh, <laughs> you, know, you, you know, you've got to buy a ticket. I mean, you, you, or you can't win the lottery. Uh, and uh, T. Dan said, there is a play here of Shakespearean proportion. <laughs> and I went to see him, and then I went to see a lot of other people via him, and I ended up writing Our Friends in the North. Um, the BBC came to me and said, we think this would make a fantastic television serial. I said, I think you're wrong. <laughs> um, but they gradually persuaded me to, it sounds weird, doesn't it, but they actually persuaded me to accept a commission 
for what was a four times 50 minute uh, adaptation of Our Friends in the North, um, which 13 years later was, <laughs> was eventually broadcast. It, writing Our Friends in the North and most of all shooting it up here, I found myself coming back a lot, I had to come back a lot. And I sort of, it was, I fell in love with Newcastle and the North East again. Our Friends of the North is totally about the North East of England and London and the relationship between them. You can't imagine Our Friends of the North without the North East. It simply wouldn't exist. Wouldn't, it wouldn't matter, actually, if it, if it weren't set in those two places at that particular time. Similarly, George Gentry, which has although the, the novels aren't set in the northeast, I wanted to move them to the northeast because I wanted the colloquial rhythms of the speech that I know. I wanted uh, what comes, um, it's not that it's, it, well, it does come easily to write for me to write uh, in the colloquial rhythms of the northeast because it's in my blood, but I wanted that particular form of speech amongst detectives, although George Gentry is an outsider, the others all have the accent. Essentially my TV debut, now this wouldn't, again, wouldn't happen I don't think uh, 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 now. Um, so again, be lucky. Uh, my TV debut was five times 90 minutes on BBC Two, where I was told, write about anything you want, as long as it's, uh, it's got a legal case in it each week. Um, so Blind Justice did, did very well and won lots of prizes. And, um, and so, needless to say, I didn't have anything done for another eight years. So uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny old world TV. Uh, there's a... There's a growing um, bias against ambition. The problem, when I was starting out 30, 40 years ago, and I don't want to pretend there was some kind of golden age, but look, there wasn't. It's never been easy for me to get anything on. Look at how long I had to wait for our friends and all, how long I had to wait for the Devil's Hall. If you add them together back to back, it was 27 years to get those projects on. I got uh, a call from uh, someone in the BBC, T Tessa Ross, another champion and heroine who said, what are you going to do next? And I said, anything but a TV serial, I'll tell you that. And she said, well, that's a shame because I've got this document um, about the English Civil War, which I think you'd rather like, but it's a TV series. So I did read it, and I absolutely loved it, and that led to The Devil's Whore 14 years later. Right. Now, I learned to be a better writer by making mistakes and watching, watching it, by watching it five years later and going, oh, God. You know, mm. you could have done that in half the time with half as many words, you know. Um, but, you know, why, why use one word when three will do?